Ladies and gentlemen, dear guests, uh, welcome to the final keynote session after a very and very extensive morning. Uh, thank you for joining us in the diverse sessions. Um, they have been rich and plenty, at least the ones I've been joining, and I hope yours have been too. And I have now the honor to welcome David Simon, our next keynote speaker. Welcome, David. Thank you. David uh, is a professor of development geography at the Royal Holloway University of London and fellow of the Academy of Social Sciences. In a second month of the Royal Holloway University, he acted as director of Mistra Urban Future, which is a very highly influential research center based at Chalmers University of Technology in Gothenburg, Sweden. Mm -hmm. His research encompasses the interface between development and the environment within the context of sustainability and global environmental and climate change. He pays particular attention to urban, peri-urban, rural and regional development, which fits well to the topic of our conference. We met Simon through his book, Rethinking Sustainable Cities, Accessible, green and fair, published in 2016. I'm sure that his new book on comparative urban research from theory to practice, co-production for sustainability will inspire us as well. Finally, David was responsible for the final chapter of the recently launched World Cities Report 2020 by UN Habitat titled The Value of Sustainable Urbanization. And he calls for a much stronger harnessing and enhancing the value of sustainable urbanization. Dear, dear participants, uh, please use the feed in your computer for questions and comments to David after his presentation. Now, David, we are looking forward to your keynote. Thank you very much, Zygun, and it's both a pleasure to be here, but a sadness that I cannot be physically with you in Leipzig, which was the original plan. But congratulations to you both and the team for having been able to stage this wonderful hybrid event, which is so much better than having had to cancel it, which is what we at one stage feared might happen. It's quite a challenge to provide the closing uh, keynote for a conference of this sort. So what I will be doing is trying to pull together some elements of what has already been said in these last two days, but also to move the focus from the bigger picture towards the tools for actually trying to do much of which is now incorporated in the spirit of the new Leipzig Charta or Charter in English as we heard in detail from Zilke Weidner yesterday morning. And so the emphasis in the new version on common good, on justice, on um, different spatial scales and the co-production of solutions, which is a key part of the methodological framing, is very much what I will be addressing in this talk. And of course, as, as many of us know from experience over many years, most of the existing tools that we have for trying to undertake um, the challenge of meeting the so-called wicked problems of sustainability, climate change, uh, and other transboundary processes are inadequate. They're often also rather discredited and therefore why do we think that old discredited tools will be appropriate for unprecedented challenges in unprecedented times? In other words, we need different approaches, not necessarily a radical break, but to develop further many of the ideas of participatory, especially the so-called deep participatory methods that have been experimented with over the last uh, 20 or so years, and particularly the ideas of co-creation, co-design, co-production, which, as I just mentioned, are now embedded within the um, new Leipzig Charta. 
The starting point, though, should be to think a little bit critically about urban-rural relationships as the basis for forging durable and successful urban-rural partnerships. And the first point to remind ourselves of is that that simple dichotomy of the urban versus the rural as a kind of structural opposition with competing uh, and conflicting agendas very often is also outdated and unhelpful. We always think now in this context of a rural urban or indeed a rural uh, urban rural continuum. Um, we have the peri-urban areas as again was mentioned several times yesterday in between but it is not uh, a steep edge, it is a continuum. The gradient may be uneven, the gradient can change over time, but if we frame our thinking in that way, it helps us to understand what needs to be done and to understand the complementarities, the existing functional linkages, and also the gaps and the challenges that have to be overcome if we are to achieve the idea of sustainable urban rural uh, partnerships, which indeed is also the spirit that underlines the Stadtland Plus initiative, um, which underpins this conference, and again about which we heard quite a lot since yesterday morning. We also have to remind ourselves very clearly that there are very diverse empirical and institutional contexts. These vary by country, they vary within countries, um, in a federal structure such as in Germany, um, the situation varies from Lunt to Lunt. Um, it varies in the UK from uh, county to county and then the individual boroughs and likewise in, in many other places. The challenge though in the context of our concerns today is that some local authority units may de be defined as essentially urban, others may be as rural, but that these have different powers, they have different responsibilities, different capabilities and capacities, and also access to and control over um, very diverse sources of revenue. <clears throat> in the context of urban change, and in many parts of the world, the focus here is very much about a expansion, but in the context, for example, of, of where you are in Sachsen, um, the, the recent history of urban shrinkage or contraction is also very, very important. But these changing urban boundaries do not always sit conveniently with the boundaries of different local authorities. And therefore we get administrative complexity, which makes the idea of working collectively or collaboratively across these boundaries very complicated and challenging. There are often different pressures around the green belts or the urban fringe, um, pressures either to develop because it's cheaper than in the existing cities or to redevelop so-called brownfield sites where old buildings, old uses are no longer required and it is often um, more important to redevelop, create new activities, new livelihoods, new opportunities within the existing area. But some of this will involve land use changes, even where cities might be stable or stagnating. And I thought the film that we saw last night on Leipzig exemplified this very, very well, the challenges and crucially, what can be done about them when different stakeholders, different partners overcome their differences and their suspicions and understand that what they have in common both today and potentially in the future is actually stronger and more important than that which divides and separates. So the crucial thing is to understand these divisions of powers, of responsibilities and resources between the different national, regional and local authorities and also between state and non-state actors. Now the challenge here is very much that these powers, responsibilities, rather like the administrative boundaries of each of these government bodies, are often rigid and not able to keep pace with the speed of change in relation to economic restructuring, climate change, um, any of the other challenges, rather like meeting the pandemic that we're faced at the moment. And this creates rigidities and uncertainties about how to act. And the logic of what I'm going to be arguing now is that if we find different tools, 
some of these challenges can actually be overcome, even if we do not have a sort of strategic metropolitan or regional coordinational level. But the importance of these different transboundary challenges, both within one metropolitan urban area or across parts of a country, across many countries, across the world, are fundamentally part of the phenomenon that we have today. We could even say in German, part of the zeitgeist. Um, sustainability, climate or broader environmental change, the unprecedented mobility of people, of goods, of services, of finance and other resources, and also epidemics and pandemics or other categories of public health emergency, which take advantage of human mobility, of flying around the world in a jet plane in a few hours to spread from the point of origin to become truly global in an incredibly short time. So we need new partnerships, we need new tools to try to meet these challenges. And this puts more emphasis on collaboration across borders horizontally, but also vertically. And as is now well known in the literature on climate change, for example, what we need is effective multi-level governance. <clears throat> and this indeed, not just of the Leipzig Charter, but of the global sustainable development agenda, which was adopted in 2015, 2016, emphasizes this. The Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction, the 2030 Agenda and its uh, 17 Sustainable Development Goals, the Paris Accord on Climate Change, and the New Urban Agenda. And the emphasis, therefore, in this collaboration is not to become quite literally stuck at the political or administrative boundaries, but to think about regions that are appropriate for the particular challenge to hand. So these could be functional urban areas or, or biogeographical or agroecological, other forms of environmental regions, watersheds, river basins, whatever. And so the concept of the city region has become increasingly um, important in the context of these sorts of urban rural partnerships. And if we can make progress in that way, we will also gain public trust, which as we're all very well aware, regardless of which country or which land or which stadt we live in, have often been very low in recent years because of um, the apparent irrelevance to many people, the lack of ability to make good progress in meeting these challenges, and because, as I've mentioned, many of the traditional planning methods and tools and the idea of turning up to vote in an election every few years is not adequate for these sorts of challenges. And here is just one example of how a, uh, a city region approach has been adopted very successfully for promoting sustainable food systems. It can lead directly to improvement in economic, social, environmental conditions, both within the urban core, in the, the peri-urban uh, area and adjacent rural areas. And it can do this by promoting improved access to nutritious, affordable and safe food, improving the livelihoods of the producers, who, by the way, are not only in rural areas, they are very much in peri-urban areas and increasingly as an important object of policy also in urban areas. So the idea, the concept of urban and peri-urban agriculture has become widely popularized and is really important in many parts of the global south, where just to give two specific examples, um, at least half the food that is consumed in metropolitan Dar es Salaam in Tanzania and Kampala in Uganda is actually produced within those metropolitan areas. So this reduces the uh, food miles, it reduces food waste and loss, and it shortens the food value chains. But in order to make this kind of a system a reality rather than just a coincidence when it happens, we need these participatory and ideally co-productive forms of governance and planning that bring all the different stakeholders, the participants together, and we have therefore to cross some of these crucial boundaries.
<clears throat> but in order to rise to this challenge as a basis for moving forward, it is really important to acknowledge the problems of the existing systems and situations and tools as I've described them. And here in these five bullet points are some of the most important. In our planning and budgeting processes and our election cycles, we think just in a few short years at a time, three, four, maybe five, and extremely exceptionally perhaps six in certain countries. And how then can we address sustainability, climate, environmental change, um, the, the broader public health situation, when all of these we know are medium to long-term challenges that require medium to long-term strategic planning. And crucially that that planning has to be holistic and integrated, not undertaken on the basis of individual sectors, industry, agriculture, water, electricity, energy, da 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 da, which is still the norm, rather, uh, still the exception, rather than the norm. And where, for reasons that we all understand, the basis of that planning is still constrained by the political boundaries of whichever body or organization is undertaking the planning. Unless there is a strategic metropolitan authority, unless the provincial or the state or the, the LUNT level provides that for the local planning and government units, and the national provides that across the different lender or provinces or states. But the other problem is that far too often, we still rely on socio-technical solutions where they are led by experts um, and the procedures of so-called public consultation are often inadequate and top-down. They're too limited, they're too formalistic, where many participants feel unable to participate fully and actively. They perceive that the options they are being given have been predetermined and pre-decided and will not really depend other than the choice between A, B, and C on their inputs, their priorities, their preferences. So that underscores the importance of what I called deep participatory planning and governance or cooperative or co-productive. There are many, many tools, but the problem is that many of them are more time consuming, they might be more resource intensive, and again, they quickly bump up against political constraints of the reality. We need to approve the budget by this deadline. We need to approve the next three-year or five-year plan by the deadline, even if these participatory processes have not yet um, been completed. And there is a very well-documented process um, that occurred in the 1990s and the early 2000s, where the idea of participation became popularized. It was adopted by many um, official development assistance partners, by many governed authorities, and therefore very quickly, we had a requirement that projects and processes had to involve participation. But it became devalued. It became a quick and dirty version rather than a deep and meaningful version. And therefore, it became what the editors of one um, well-known book called the tyranny of participation. And so it became discredited and people sought for alternatives. Hence, the follow-up book a few years later with the title Participation from Tyranny to Transformation with a question mark at the end. And part of that search for alternatives brings us to the wide and diverse group of methods and tools, which we now call co-design, co-creation, or co-production, which are the focus of the last part of my talk. And um, again, many of you may know the so-called ladder of citizen participation that was popularized in 1969 by the architect Sherry Arnstein. And what I've done here on the left-hand side is to modify or update it, not in terms of the, the nine categories or steps on the ladder, but in trying to distinguish them in relation to levels of shallow to deep participation, where I've got somewhere between uh, level three and level seven, 
And then these different kinds of co-production, co-creation, co-design, which are at the top end between levels um, seven and nine. <clears throat> the important thing here is that these share, despite their individual differences, a very different philosophical underpinning from conventional methods central to them, and therefore the point of departure, if you like, is the idea that there is no single dominant voice, there is no single form of knowledge. They are multiple, and that all of them have uh, value and something to contribute, just as all stakeholders in the problem have something to, con to contribute, including the professional technical experts, but not as primus inter pares, if you like, but as one amongst many. This reflects and enables the different worldviews, the different perceptions, priorities of the various stakeholders, which again, we saw illustrated very effectively, I thought, in the film last night on, on Leipzig. Now doing this is inherently transdisciplinary because it brings together uh, professionals, be they planners, architects, academic researchers, and other stakeholders, the residents of different neighborhoods, of different kinds of housing, the different groups of people who use urban, peri-urban, and rural space. And the names of these different methods reflect the changes over the last 20 or 30 years away from just inter or multidisciplinarity among different groups of professional or different academic disciplines towards this um, involvement as full partners of different stakeholders. But there is a key limitation and that is that there is no blueprint, there is no master plan or template that you can use in one place and then transfer to another. Local appropriateness and designing something amongst the people in the team to move forward in a way that is regarded as acceptable and appropriate in the local urban, agroecological, environmental or political context is fundamental to the success of all of these tools. <clears throat> the figure on the right hand side is an attempt in, in a sort of artistic way to represent um, some of that diversity and, and some of the challenges. And I said a few minutes ago that fundamental here is learning that what these different stakeholders actually share in terms of their interests and their desires for the future is usually more important than that which divides. The problem with the traditional short and uh, dirty methods and the very quick time frame is that there's never time to explore those similarities. They almost um, focus on and restrict us paying attention to the differences. And that's why the real potential for transformation, for making substantial and substantive change in how we go about the business of tackling the wicked sustainability, climate change, and other um, societal challenges is still very much to be explored. But the fundamental challenge in doing that is to overcome the short-term nature and the self-interest of the individual, of the household, of the particular socioeconomic or neighborhood group, or the group of professionals who have been trained in most cases to believe that they are the experts who can make a big difference by recommending the best technical solution for residents, citizens, farmers, whoever it might be, without actually taking them on board fully. So let's be honest, let's address and acknowledge the limitations to these fundamentally different um, tools and methods. As I mentioned, there is no blueprint, there's no template, there's no magic or silver bullet. And the need to make each initiative and project um, from the beginning, de novo, make it designed by the participants is a limitation because it increases the startup and the actual activity and transactional costs. It creates uncertainty about the timeline and the outcomes. And it doesn't fit well 
with these existing restrictions and constraints of budget and project and reporting cycles, which are very short, they're very fixed, they're very inflexible. And there is a real challenge to maintain the interest in the engagement of people, particularly if they are poor, particularly if they're concerned with meeting their um, income or livelihood targets on a daily basis and do not have large amounts of time to spend negotiating, discussing, building scenarios for the future and so on. And how then do we overcome these challenges of the immediate priorities of the short termism and of self-interest, which we know is an important part of what makes each of us human as individuals and makes each of us behave in certain ways in our particular interest group. Those of you of a certain age might remember a book from the hippie culture of the late 1960s, early 1970s, called The Zen of Bicycle, uh, of Motorbike Maintenance, Motorcycle Maintenance. Well, I think increasingly of this challenge as the Zen of Relationship Maintenance, because it puts the emphasis on building confidence and trust, enabling the weaker, the less well-educated, the smaller people in the room to speak freely and to understand that others do actually value their contribution and they're not simply there uh, to, to add faces in the photograph or, or to contribute official legitimacy to a short exercise. The other problem is that many of these solutions may work well at the local, at the neighborhood scale. They are not as easy to scale up. And so in the last few slides, I want to share with you um, one way that we are trying to overcome this problem by sharing many of the different examples that we either developed or we um, modified from elsewhere in the work of transdisciplinary knowledge production for co-producing in urban sustainability research within the program of Mr. Urban Futures that um, Zigwon mentioned in her introduction. And we have pulled these together in a new book or a manual, if you like, of, of good practice that is currently being produced by Practical Action Publishing in the UK. And it will be available in February or March, both in the traditional paper format, but free on open access to download electronically wherever you are around the world. And we see this as an important part of our legacy of the research center, where we will hopefully provide guidelines and crucially explain what worked and what the problems and limitations were in each of the individual city contexts where um, they were implemented as a way to help you all to modify and to adapt them to your local circumstances so that they can be hopefully um, relevant and appropriate and not simply try to replicate in a blueprint way what you read in the book from somewhere else. This is not about co-production elsewhere. It's about developing and expanding and exploring co-design, co-creation and co-production locally in your own contexts. <clears throat> These are some of the key um, categories of examples which cover situations where leadership and participation is relatively symmetrical. In other words, the distribution of power relations is not um, too unequal. It has a whole series of um, elements guiding us through how you formulate problems and design solutions through iterative design thinking in different ways in different circumstances. We have examples of what were called study circles of writing together the proposal, the methodology uh, and profound change, as it says. Uh, workshops in specific contested spaces or spaces in need of a solution for which nobody has come up with uh, an acceptable idea yet. There are good examples of backcasting and the use of the symbio city and similar methodologies where unlike conventional forecasting where you start today and you say, well, let's think about how things go five, 10, 15 years in the future. 
you start with the future. Where do we want to be in 2030 when Agenda 2030 comes to an end? And what do we need to do between now in 2020 and then in 2030 to achieve our aspirations? And so you build a series of, of milestones, if you like, um, and can phase the uh, work that you need to do in order to get there. There are other examples of projects that have been designed centrally, but implemented locally according to local circumstances, such as the projects that we ran on the implementation and the engagement by different cities with the Sustainable Development Goals and the New Urban Agenda. And then, rather like we were hoping to do in Leipzig this week, exchange visits where groups of local authority officials of private enterprise um, people or, or civil society people could come to a different circumstance, a different situation, and learn by exposure and discussion and take back some of those lessons in what we called reflective translocal learning. But crucial in all of this is facilitation. Um, it can be professional by professional facilitators or by one of the groups. But somebody fulfilling this role of a kind of honest broker is also important to bring and to hold the different stakeholders together, to explore that common ground um, and to help to stimulate a positive atmosphere and to manage the implicit or explicit unequal power relations so that the most important politically speaking, the most powerful organization, the best educated people do not drown out the voices of everybody else. And having a neutral or a so-called safe space in order to do this work, we've also found extremely valuable. We need to discuss and agree the objectives and the purpose, the how. And again, as the bullet points say, it's time consuming. You get, need to get to know one another. You need to understand the priorities and the perceptions of the other people, the other groups. And crucially, you need to identify and figure out how to use everybody's experience and expertise. Um, and those are not just simply the technical experts. And then decide what the desired level of co-design and creation and production is, the what. What divisions of labor? Are we going to do it all ourselves or are we going to get some external um, specialist to help us with a particular technology once we've decided what to do or to explore the alternatives in more detail so we can make the decision? What are the relevant timelines? What are the institutional deadlines? And is it realistic to try to meet those? In preparing this lecture, I came across a quotation from a friend and colleague in, in the US today, Anthony Bebbington, um, writing a number of years ago, mainly about participatory methods. But as I put there in square brackets, this applies our fort theory also to co-production and co-design. The idea that theorizing uh, participatory development and co-production necessarily requires engagement with practices that pose awkward questions about our attitudes, our behavior, about unexpected outcomes and normative commitments. Meanwhile, practicing participation necessarily requires engagement with theories that pose difficult questions and challenges and that force the practitioner never to lose sight of the wider picture. I couldn't think of uh, a neater way to end this talk. And all I've done on this final uh, slide is pull together um, six of the key messages um, about the importance of the urban and rural partnerships exemplifying the nature of our sustainability challenges and the diverse nature of our stakeholders, the inadequacy um, or inappropriateness of most of the conventional political and planning processes and the tools. I've pointed out how transdiscipline co-production methods can be helpful, but with warnings that there's no silver or magic bullet or blueprint, we have to work case by case. We need to make explicit the power relations which are often implicit. And simply by coming into the room and sitting down to say we're going to do co-production, doesn't kind of make them disappear. We have to address and overcome them and neutralize them in order to be effective. And finally then, it may not be possible 
to reach consensus. This is often sort of dream somehow that if we talk long and hard enough or slowly and repeatedly enough, we will all eventually agree on something. But it is not always the case. And therefore we do sometimes need a mechanism to break the deadlock, to break the logjam. Let me leave it there and put up another diagram um, that explains some of this process graphically while we address some of the questions you might have. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, David. Thank you very much. Excellent. You draw such a rich picture describing exactly our discussions during the last day and also this morning. <laughs> and of course, we have some questions to you. Yeah, I'd be worried if you didn't. Uh, there are indeed a couple of questions, but for time reasons, we kindly ask you to uh, answer in brief, So, uh, which will be very easy for you, I guess. Um, in a diverse co-environment, Bertram Schiffes uh, from the uh, Eber Tübing is asking, um, in a diverse co-environment, how do you achieve binding lawful decisions about money, uh, decisions about lawful resources. Um, in the end, uh, where is there the bottleneck, um, he's asking? That I can answer very quickly. Um, the best example, perhaps, from many case studies that have now been well documented around the world, from their initial origins in, in Brazil, um, but now used in, in many parts of the world, including in Europe, um, are initiatives on participatory budgeting, where exactly the kind of steps I've outlined have been undertaken by bringing together different groups of citizens in, in towns and cities to decide jointly how to spend the available budget. And what this does is it brings to the fore the question of why certain groups of people would like, for example, to build new highways or, or, or a new autobahn, um, whereas others want rather to have public transport or perhaps to redesign their neighborhood for fewer vehicles to make them safer for pedestrians and for children to play or how you prioritize a new school or a kindergarten versus a new healthcare center or clinic. Thank you. And Thank these you are the mechanisms and processes that you use. But there is no one bottleneck because in every different situation, there can be different ones. Um, the leadership of the city, people who walk out or get frustrated with the system, or it becomes bureaucratized after a few years, as in Porto Alegre in Brazil, where it has now kind of lost some of its initial um, success, which, which built its reputation. So again, there's no simple answer, but there are many examples we can follow and learn from. Thank you for outlining that, David. Um, for those <coughs> watching in the mobile event app at the moment, a technical notice, uh, you can stay in this room to follow the stream also for the closing session, which is timed directly now, so that also gives us an impression where we are on times. Uh, but David, uh, really with uh, the request for a one sentence answer, which is, <laughs> can be a longer one, but, but uh, one sentence, not more. <laughs> uh, Annette Richter is asking about your opinion if we want to move from co-design to co-sharing uh, in the sense of open science, open policy and open participation in democracy. What pathways to openness uh, is dissolving spaces and places? Uh, what is your view on that? One sentence, right. Um, again, many of these issues apply. There is also now a vast array of citizen science initiatives where different stakeholders participate in finding, collecting the data and solving the problem. But one of the things that is important here is the idea that the experts or the funders do not have a monopoly of the new knowledge or the new technology, which are then protected by patents. They have to be open access like many university, other uh, researchers now publish their work so that there is not a paywall, they are not restricted, they're not protected by patents or other intellectual property um, monopolies. Thank you very much.